Welcome to The Chat. This is a podcast from the team at Glasgow City Mission, the first and the granddaddy of the global city mission movement. I'm Charles Marks, proud to be CEO at this time. This series is intended as a resource and a point of connection for anybody interested in the work that goes on at Glasgow City Mission. I want to speak to people whose passion, vocation, career, faith journey or life aligns with an aspect of the work and the rhythm of what we do. Many will have a faith perspective, some will not. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Please check out our website, our social media platforms. Click like, subscribe to our YouTube channel and add us to your favourites. Feedback is welcome, but please keep it clean, keep it civil. Thank you. Okay, so listen, Paul, um, great to see you and great to have you here. Thank you, Paul McGarry. Um, I think I've known you since you were maybe 16, possibly 17 years old. So that's a delightful thing for me. And we'll get into that. I'm just going to say that up front for anybody that might listen to this, this is the 1st of December 2020. Who knows when anybody might access this rambling chat that we're going to have. Um, But I can hear my wife just pulled up in the car, right? Who knows? I'm going to apologize in advance. There might be noise. There might be dogs barking. I don't know. But um, we'll just keep going. Yeah, Paul, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if that door goes slightly ajar, that's my nine-year-old son, Noah, who's off off school today, sick. So. Ah, right. Okay. Anything can happen. happen. Yeah, and we don't care. Right, fine. Because it's our show, right? You and me, Paul. It's you and me. So, um, Paul, why don't you introduce yourself for us, would you, and for the people that are listening? And bearing in mind then, I don't know who's going to listen to this in the future. Maybe nobody. <laughs> but I hope people that are interested in the work of Glasgow City Mission, uh, right. people that are perhaps trying to find out more about mission in Glasgow generally, um, or homelessness in Glasgow, or any, anything to do with poverty in Glasgow, but people that are generally interested in the sort of work that Glasgow City Mission do. So from that point of view, from that perspective, Paul, Gary, tell us who you are and what you're doing. All right, basically, so in, in the briefest sense, my name is Paul McGarry. I'm vice convener of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Uh, I'm the also now the housing spokesperson for the Scottish Liberal Democrats, which I think is interesting. I think we'll probably go into that in a bit because I'm one of the few people involved in politics who's actually had any lived experience of being homeless. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been connecting with organisations like the City Mission over several years, uh, other organisations doing work uh, across Glasgow, the trustee for a number of years for Blue Triangle Housing Association, so mm-hmm. been sort of very involved in what's going on, but always willing to find out more and discover more and engage more, um, but so in 30 seconds, that's it. Yeah, well, that's not bad, but you've covered a lot, and yeah. some of it needs explored, right? So let me just okay. spin back the dial a little bit. I'd moved to Scotland in 2000 and um, I'd had a I'd been through some homeless well, homelessness and, and lots of misadventure and, and and all the rest of it that led us one day a part of my testimony in fact was that when I was in Bristol I imagined this coffee shop as a place of contact and of meeting people and then while I was studying for land economics um, degree which was to get me involved in property which ironically now you're doing um, with the lived there, <laughs> but anyway, um, I thought, gosh, I can't get a cappuccino in this town, can't get a decent coffee in Paisley at all. So I thought, well, there's only one thing for it. And if I'm studying and I don't have money, then I could wait tables in a restaurant or I can open a coffee shop. And I thought, well, duh, what else does a student do on their third year? But in the summer recess, um, fit out and open a small coffee shop. And then the first customers was Gail Chalk. She was my very first customer with Pauline Ward. And um, she says, oh, my husband's a minister down the road. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then the next thing is all the youth uh, and young people start flooding into my coffee shop every day, which was wonderful. And now I have um, a son-in-law and uh, four grandsons as a consequence of this happening. Which so we're delighted, but one of the other wonderful things that happened was that I very quickly met you on the very first invite to go and attend this church is event was a baptism on the shore of Loch Lomond at Luss. And if I'm right in my memory, I do believe it was the day you were baptized in Loch Lomond. Hey, eh? that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, and you say the summer, I mean, I. 
I swear that water must have been winterish. It was cold. It was freezing. But yeah, absolutely. It was a case of like, how do we how do we do this? And you know, they were like, well, let's just drive up to Loch Lomond and get baptized. And I was like, it's a great idea. We'll go and do that. And it was brilliant. It was it was an incredible day for me, really important day. Um but yeah, it was freezing cold. It was cold, but then we got to know you as a family, my yeah. wife and I, and um, you were very sweet with our kids. And and in fact, you were beautifully helpful one time with my sister, who sadly has passed away now, but she was up um, fleeing a crack uh, gang that had taken over her house with her kids. And they came up and you were you were wonderfully helpful at that time with her children. In fact, you, you went above and way beyond. Um, and I'm still grateful for that. But when we met you then, you were in... Well, you lived in this flat that, frankly, even though I'd been housed in a homeless accommodation in Bristol, when I went to see that flat that you were in, in Seed Hill, do you remember that? Yeah. Next to the Hockhead train station? Yeah. Next I said, to, next next to, to a homeless shelter. Next to a homeless shelter. I went, I went home to Adele and I said, I have never seen a flat like that. I can't believe they give him a flat like that to live in. And, of course, then you've got all the randomers that live in the close around you and you're like 17 yeah. And a big friendly guy with an English accent, trying not to sound too English. <laughs> you know the score. <laughs> well, that was exactly it, and it was it was strange because obviously, you know, just a few years before that, I'd obviously been homeless, and um, so and I'd been living in this this shelter, and then one day, you know, came up to well, first to Manchester for a short period. Um, where you know it wasn't the right project for me. It was a very middle class church, middle class project. Clearly, that was not quite computing. So then moved up to Scotland, and it was incredible because I thought the place looked great. I could see on the street outside uh, that was an option. I thought it looked great. It was, it was interesting because it was obviously you know big culture change for me. I mean, I didn't know the the project I was going to would pay my change fest. I hitchhiked up. Because for me, that was kind of like the natural language of things to do was just to sit my foot up to get to something. Yeah, to I did me. the same many for many years. And, you know, I got there and they, I, I phoned them and said, oh, listen, this is where I am. And they're like, right, um, is, is, is your train coming? And I was like, no, no, I, I, I just came up. I'm, I'm here with my like rucksack on, my bag ready to go. And that, that was like the first point where I was like, okay, there might be a slight culture shock here. In terms yeah. Of yeah. Maybe going into this like middle class church world um, because the languages didn't quite, quite compute. But then, yeah, obviously, then moved to Scotland and they put me in this uh, flat. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't as much have carpets as pieces of carpet strung together. It was rancid, man. I don't know. You should the, the, the fact that they would put a seventeen-year-old young man uh, in that accommodation. I mean, it's a blessing that you got accommodation, that you had a roof, right? Yeah, and we're glad of it. But um, for a guy that was connecting with people, how come you came to Paisley? What brought you to Paisley? Why specifically Paisley? I mean, Cornwall, <laughs> Manchester, Paisley, right? Yeah. So there was a. There was a project called Careforce, which was a Christian organization that placed volunteers. And they largely did it that it would be sort of often the children of the manse or people from overseas were the main people that were kind of involved in, as volunteers. And I think, so I, I'd become a Christian maybe about six, seven months before this and, you know, gave my life to the Lord at, uh, events linked to sort of surfing that were happening around Cornwall and I'd sort of connected with these people and then got asked a wonderful wonderful lady at Plymouth Methodist Central Hall called Veronica um absolutely incredible lady so she I, I turned up to um Plymouth Methodist Central Hall probably a little less than where I needed to be premium wise to walk yeah. into a church uh but you know she just loved me and she just loved on me and you know everything we were doing she was like engaging me uh involving me with some of the young people work that we were doing uh they had a group that was picnic youngsters that were 
younger than me, but kind of not dissimilar to me. And, you know, it was great. I came in and we, we connected well with them. So they, they paid them for me to go with them to help as a youth leader to Soul Survivor. And that's when I connected with this organization. And they said, well, we're always looking for volunteers. I said, here we go. Um, and so volunteers, and nobody kind of cottoned on to anything of maybe this <laughs> a little bit more raw and rough than we originally expected. And I think that was, when I first went to Manchester, that was probably, probably exactly it. It was like, hang on a second here. Who's this guy connecting in with a bunch of other guys who, you know, kids of the manse. And, you know, one of them turned around to me and said, oh, I've put on the cleaning rotor for you just to, to do, do the toilets because you might be more used to it. And he, he meant that in like a kind way. Me, how, like, that, how, how could that be a kind thing? How, how, tell oh, me how you think what that. What on earth is going on here? <laughs> and so safe to say the relationship never quite worked out. And in that house, it never quite worked out. Like one of the kids, uh, bless him, decided it would be a great idea to phone my mum <laughs> to get advice on me. Really? <laughs> which, yeah, yeah, which was, was interesting because uh, yeah my mom was slightly more more removed than I was just yeah she was like just take a boot off his ass <laughs> sorry, but, but, of his backside sorry <laughs> I've raised the age score of this sick mission now uh, that's all right no no podcast, we're gonna have, to have an advisory company we but, if, um, if, if 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 they if let's just let's just deal with that um if they would if anybody hears that is offended they need to come to the mission in order to do desensitizing training uh at the door or on our outreach teams um so yeah that, that's yeah. okay Paul. <laughs> don't you worry about a thing fabulous well and so so it obviously there was a connection issue there and then he said well right okay so we'll go move him to we've got some other projects that he might be interested in so there was one that was like in the east end of london uh, there was another one I think in Hull somewhere, and uh, another one in Short Roads in Paisley. And um, you know, felt a, a sense of peace with the idea of going to Scotland. I've always loved Scotland. Uh, it's funny because when you go to Scotland, you realise, and it's only when I moved to Scotland I realised there's any kind of Scottish English thing. Yeah. Like growing up in Cornwall, it really just didn't exist. Yeah. Like Scotland has a special place of love for the people of Cornwall growing up. Sure. So, you know, for me, it was like brilliant. Move, move straight to to Paisley to work on this project in Short Roots, which you know was a area of multiple deprivation, all sorts of issues going on, um, you know, domestic violence issues. Is that the Star Project. The Star Project, exactly. That's yeah, exactly yeah. What it was. They're still going, I think. Yeah. So I, I started there as like an apprentice youth worker, uh, and then basically started, um, you know building on realized that you know there wasn't much continuity in these sort of projects i did some stuff with an organization called g1 doing youth work at different churches around scotland and then i went went to the us as you'll remember uh -huh. uh, and was there for three months you know I, I connected with this group that was doing mission work and they basically paid for me to go over there and experience the way they did things and to help me develop as a potential youth worker. I think one of the things that became apparent to me was I wasn't quite ready to do that. And actually the, the gap between, you know, the chaotic life that I'd come from and what I was trying to do and the people I was trying to help was probably too large at this point. Right. And so, yeah, I came back with a sense of, I don't think I should be doing youth work anymore. And so I started, you know, working in sort of call centre environments and you know just got, was really blessed then to be able to raise that and get involved and, and and push it and I think you know that's when I got involved in, in in sort of politics. Well how did you get involved I mean what's the what's the jump between um falling well coming to an awareness that perhaps youth work isn't where you should channel your energy when did politics move into your eye line? I mean, notwithstanding that the corn, your Cornish kind of independence, um, come on the Celts type <laughs> stuff, but where well, does politics it. feature? Um, so it was it was just generally a sense of this is crap, this isn't right, you know. 
still involved in connecting with people who, who live like two doors down from me and other people who lived across the street from me and always there sort of trying to help folk out and get involved with people wherever I could, despite the fact it wasn't like my job anymore. And, you know, there was things like folk getting housed and I was like, why is this, why is this a challenge? That like, there's a guy who's been beaten up by the guy who lives opposite him. And now he's like lost his job because he can't get out the door. He can't, you know, go out and, you know, he's got mental health problems stemming from the fact that the guy opposite the flat decked him. Yeah. How, how is this challenging to like realize that this can all be solved if we move the guy? Well, one of them. As, as it happened, the guy who's the victim wanted to be the one to move. Right. You know, and because I normally wouldn't say, you know, move the victim, I said, move the person who's causing the issues. But no, he wanted to move. So he, he was really keen to. And, you know, so I spent some time at the housing association going, why can we not do this? You know, roadblocks, spoke to the councillors, you know, nothing was happening there, you know, spoke to the other people. This isn't for me, this is for someone else. Yeah. And, you know, I just couldn't engage with them, you know, citing all sorts of data laws and stuff. And I just thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. So, so I started getting involved in a political party to understand, you know, how we can try and change things. And one of the people I spoke to invited me along. I, I then decided that, you know, they were sort of a working class party. And I thought, you know, right on, Charlie, that's Comrades United, but it wasn't for me. Who's that, the Labour uh, Party? It was, yeah. <laughs> it was first. Yeah. And it, you, know, when, you know when they cut the 10p tax? Yeah. So I couldn't understand why this party who represented folk like me, when the financial crisis happened, the first people they went after were people like me. Well, uh, but say, hey, but that's not going to be any different this time around, is it? The people that are going to pay the the two trillion tax deficit is not going to be the wealthy, is it? It's going to be the. And, and this is what I felt the need to change. So then I was like, right, okay, these guys aren't for me. And then, but I was very impressed with a guy called Charles Kennedy, who mm -hmm. you know, everyone will know. And, and what he said, because he was directly saying, isn't it absolutely ridiculous that the poorest ten percent? pay more as part of their tax than the wealthiest 10%. Isn't this absolutely shocking? And I was like, yes, finally, somebody is getting this because nobody else is understanding this very simple idea. And so I started getting involved, uh, you know, just volunteering, just <laughs> delivering leaflets for them. And then somebody said, you know, would you consider being like a council candidate? We're looking for someone in, I think it was Annie Vland and John Chapel was where I first stood. And you know, and I kind of got the bug. I folk voted for me, which is huh. ridiculous. absolutely obscene as to why anybody would consider voting for me as, as the best person to be the councillor. Um, they did. And the more I knocked on people's doors and, you know, it didn't seem like rocket science. Somebody says, I've got an issue. And you go, fix the issue. You know, you use that power that you've got, that you've been given as a, like, candidate. And so I just kept, so, you know, connecting in, pushing in. And, you know, let's, let's not make it look, sound too easy. There's a lot of barriers. And there's yeah. a lot of barriers if you're not from a wealthier background. You know, I think we, just before we started recording, we were talking about exactly that. So it's absolutely ridiculous that actually, you know, those from poorer background make up so few of our politicians. Mm. The, the, the big issue at the moment is is gender balance and getting it 50 50 and i think that's perfect and that's the direction that we should be at but then when you look beyond that and you think well 40 percent of people in scotland have at some point lived in a household um that's on welfare mm -hmm. yeah there is not a single msp who would say well th th there's there's one who i think might be your msp uh but he's, he's retiring at the next parliament um is the only one who's ever sort of said, actually, you know, that's, that's my situation. I grew up in a family on welfare. And, you know, it's not a stat that's recorded. But I think even the fact that people aren't willing to say, you know what, that's me, shows that there's a problem. Mm. And shows that, you know, there's 40% of the country that's not represented. You know, we make things like tax law, we make things like welfare law, we come up with housing law. But the frame of reference is, you know, nobody's there. I mean, I've, 
the point of pushing this idea of a national minimum income, and we've been pushing it for, for so long and promoting it. There you are. <laughs> Hi, Adele. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> but, uh, and, and promoting this idea of a national minimum income. And, you know, people constantly said, you know, it's too expensive, won't work, you couldn't administrate it, it it's impossible to do. And then what happened? 800,000 middle class people understood what the welfare system was like in the last eight months. Mm. And now we're changing it. Yeah. And now the general direction of traffic is this needs to change. Never mind the fact that people have been living it for. Yeah. Decades. I mean, the th so what's nice is when somebody comes along and says, actually, these complicated things are simple, but actually, aren't they complicated? Have you seen Kevin McIntyre, Kevin Bridges' um, sketch on the universal income? No, I haven't. Oh, you I'm need just... to. Yeah, you need to see it. He says it's really simple. He says it, instead of bailing out the banks and giving um, the, the banks the trillions back in 2008, 9, 10, um, you should have created a universal income because all that money, instead of going offshores to the Bahamas or Bermuda or whatever, the Seychelles, um, that all that money would have been spent on taxes, fags and booze, and it would have all been straight back into the economy. <laughs> so you want to regenerate the economy, Give give the lowest uh, the poorest ten percent uh, universal income, and that money will be straight back, back round through the system. Plenty, not offshore like the, like it did go. You got well, to see I it. I, I I definitely support the direction, but probably not the methodology that goes. <laughs> well, nor do I. Imagine that speech. You could just imagine that speech in Parliament. <laughs> you, you need know, to see is... it because he 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 is a comedian, of course, like the jester yeah, in the courts of kings absolutely. can speak speak the truth and irony. Um, in a way that I wouldn't condone. Glasgow City Mission doesn't condone uh, any kind of substance abuse at all. Let me just put that out there, people. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> not, <laughs> not gone to the dogs. But yeah, okay. So you find yourself on a platform and being offered a platform yeah. and access to platforms where you can actually affect, materially affect um, specific incidences of people's lives. And that is a, that's, that's catnip to you. That's a potent. <laughs> That's that's it, and I think I think that's exact ex exactly right. Is that you know we then have an opportunity to start helping folk and start realizing you know if something's if something's not right, you can change it. And I think that's that's quite an empowering thing to realize is actually you know you can use this platform for good. And you know, and and I think the the interesting thing that I've realized is that you don't necessarily always need to be like the elected person. You know, I'm, I'm in a situation where, you know, I might never get elected. Yeah. You're seeing the conversation change. And there's a piece of work I'm working on at the moment around minimum wage. And, you know, it's not quite, not quite there yet. But it's like, how do you break these things apart and try and fix it? Because, you know, the national minimum wage is like a great big circle trap. So actually, you know, we've got more people today, um, you know, in, in work poverty. Mm. Sort of, uh, relative poverty than at any point in the past, you know, even before the introduction of the national minimum wage. And, you know, it's because, you know, you, you increase the national minimum wage and the costs increase. Yes. I was going to and say, because in that, the consequence of introducing a national minimum wage, in as much as the aspiration is a noble one, you actually create um, barriers because you increase the minimum. It's like housing benefit. You know, if you set, if you peg minimum housing benefit at four hundred and fifty pound a month, let's say, then the minimal rent that anyone's going to charge for one bedroom or studio flat is four hundred and fifty pound a month because they know that's what they can get, right? So you you've artificially raised the the minimal tier to that point, and then everything is built off of that. So actually, you price somebody who's working in a low paid job but isn't eligible for benefits, you're yeah. pricing them out of markets. And, and that's exactly right. And all the thinking around the national minimum wage has been, you know, you either have it or you don't. Mm. And so, you know, I've been trying to think as to how we how we can do this. And the, the other challenge that we sometimes have in politics is they always look to other people. And they look across the fence. Yeah. So we're talking about national minimum income. That's because the Canadians and the Finns and other people have done it. And, you know, we even talk about Canadian Press, I'm sure we'll come that at some point, you know, and that's because, you know, it started overseas and, you know, we've seen other models of it work. But this is something that, you know, there's only ever been two models. You have national minimum wage or you don't have it. And I think 
what I saw at the beginning of the summer when you had the furlough is that we obviously have the means to be able to fix these problems. And maybe what we could do is introduce some kind of premium to the national minimum wage that doesn't add a burden onto employers. Yeah. And thereby trying to break the cycle of, you know, wage goes up, cost goes up. Yeah. You know, the local co-op has to raise their costs because they have to pay for more. But actually, you know, you say the government says, you know what, we'll create that premium that brings you up to that living wage. So we'll take millions of people out of poverty. Yeah. Um, take the burden off of the employers and small businesses. Yeah. So, so for the it doesn't add any burden on the small employers or the local guy down the street. He doesn't need to raise his cost. No. So your local shop stays the same price. But does it do you not create a price inflation from 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 raising it no matter how you who does it just because you haven't increased the costs of wages for the co-op once you've increased the availability of cash in the system don't don't prices go up anyway i don't know i mean i'm forgetting my economics 101 now well they, and, and and you're right they could be you know because the more disposable income comes out the more people go well actually you know i want a piece of that yeah but you you'd hope that you know, actually what you're doing is enabling people to get those essentials that they otherwise can't afford. And mm. that's what puts them into the definition of relative poverty is because, you know, the reality is there are kids falling behind right now. Yeah. And, and, and lastly, because they can't get access to the computer. They can't get access to broadband. They can't get access to dry house, you know. Well, uh, that's it, yeah. And, and you know, and, 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 that's, and that's the big problem. The biggest obstacle I've seen to sort of these kind of ideas is that nobody else has done it first. Yeah. <laughs> you tried like me too cold. Well, sorry, I shouldn't use that phrase. That phrase belongs to something else. But we're in this copycat culture of what are sure. other countries doing and not in an innovating culture of, you know, just because somebody's not done it before doesn't mean it's not right. I'll give you a live <laughs> example of that. I was talking to somebody high up in East Renfrewshire Council about the need now for schools potentially to have to find hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds per each authority to put ventilation and air circulation machinery in old in old buildings and new ones in order to make sure that the air exchange and flow was appropriate to minimize the transference of, of, of things notwithstanding that it helps you focus on your education anyway yeah. um, and it was I was like well why would you want to be spending that hundreds of thousands of pounds if uh, next year covid's like not the thing anymore apart from for the um it helps people with their faculties um to have good oxygen levels but he said no the real thing we should be doing is shutting the schools i said well why is a local authority don't you make the step because you've got all these super spreaders in schools let's say probably um why don't you make the stand then why don't you be the authority that makes the change that says we're going to shut the schools when everyone else is saying the schools must stay open He's like, well, because no one else is doing it. Mm -hmm. like it's, a, it's a perfectly sensible and logical thing to do. You've yeah. got the, the contagion of a, a virus. Um, the one thing that's being allowed to persist is schools. The people the most immune to the virus and can carry it with no one knowing they've got it are children. They're not good at observing social distancing. Um, you want to deal with the problem, <laughs> shut the schools because there's been a huge amount of damage done to kids education for those that um don't have too motivated degree educated parents who are going to set a timetable for them at home it's been there'll be massive disparities to contend with but in in terms of just doing something different that's not been done before why didn't one just do it and then the rest go oh yeah that's a good thing that's the thing it is it's, it's this democratized media that we currently have that i think is the biggest obstacle to that because i mean if you remember like and this is probably using political example, you know, back in the day, you know, politicians could just stand up and say, I disagree. And, you know, and they got a certain degree of backlash, like Charles Kennedy got a huge amount of backlash for his position on the Iraq war. Yeah. But I couldn't imagine that kind of thing happening in this day and age, because you see even the, the, the threat of somebody standing up to say, you know, something unpopular opinion. Yeah. And, and say it, and you know, and it is like the world opens up, swallows them in, and drags them through. Well, this happened you this know, weekend, Paul, yeah. with homelessness in Glasgow, because the homelessness, um, Scottish homelessness project, whatever uh, Colin is, the, our friend, yeah. um, 
they've got a new unit underneath the Helaman's umbrella in Glasgow, right? Yeah. And um, at midnight, they were doing a uh, soup kitchen type thing, supplying meals and, and all that. Well, it was midnight on Black Friday, and they had drawn a quite a big crowd of people under the Helaman's umbrella to get some free grub. Because if you offer it for free, a lot of people will come. And then somebody took a photograph of this scene. Yeah. Um, without reference to the charity or anything, they just said, this is Glasgow on Black Friday in the 21st century. This is an absolute disgrace, right? But of course, the picture was a distortion of a uh, situation, but it satisfied the p particular agenda of the people putting yeah. it up. And then the Labour, Scottish Labour guy came on and spoke into it. Yeah. Colin's charity responded, you've never had anything to do with us. You take no interest in us. You don't know what we're about. How dare you use this for political gain to attack the SNP, right? And then there was this huge backlash on the Labour guy. Yeah. Have you seen any of this on Twitter? I have, the... I have. And I, 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 I replied myself, actually. Okay. Uh, because, A, I mean, I thought, I think, you know, the kind of backlash is an example of what we're talking about. You know, yeah. you, you stick your head in. But yeah. You know, the fundamentals there, I think, are engage first, find out the answers. You know, Richard should have engaged first and found out, you know, he's a professional politician. Right. He's a professional. Do some homework. Do some homework. Find out, engage with the organisation, <laughs> find out what are their needs. Because I think you'll find that in this instance, they have tried engaging with some of his folk and they've had really positive engagement with people within the Labour Party. They've had excellent... Um, engagement with uh, it's Phil Bratt. Phil Bratt. Yeah. Excellent engagement. With I'm him. nodding like I know, but I don't know any of these people because yeah. I'm not very close to politics. But No, no. Um, you know, they could have had that engagement. And the other thing is, I don't like this whole political point story when it comes oh. to the issue of housing and homelessness. So the point I made to Richard Leonard was, you know, I was homeless in the early 2000s and it never occurred to me to blame the Labour Party till today. I saw your tweet. It never occurred to me that actually the real reason why I was homeless was because of the Labour Party and Tony Blair. Never occurred to me. No. But, but, but obviously that's nonsense. That's not the reason. My but, goodness, but you said whole, that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's an absolute <laughs> nonsense. And it's the same thing. And I think that narrative of, you know, you can't be First Minister and say these things because you haven't fixed this issue. Well, Look, when is City Mission founded? Yeah, 1826, by the way. Yeah, 1826. It's nearly 200 years you know, and we've still got work to do. And we've still got work to do. Yes. So I think, you know, laying anything like that at the front door of any person, I mean, as it happens, the homeless project that I stayed in, that, yeah. you know, supported me, was built by the Tories, was built by John Major. Right. You know, don't tell me to go, thanks, John. Really appreciate yeah, but he's, look, he's looking kind of left, isn't he, now? In, it, he is, he's starting, yeah. isn't he? I, it, it's funny, that there's, there's, there's a lot of folk in the political sphere who I'd say, you know, were, were firmly to the right, but now they've they, they probably become, I don't think they call themselves, so they probably call themselves liberals, is what they do. Yeah, they're liberals, yeah. And, Moderates. Yeah, but I think that's, a, I think that's the wider point, is, you know, using these things as political shoot -em ups but that's what yeah. this lazy, but that's what people are doing. We're in a soundbite culture, and 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 we might all l laugh at Trump doing it, but the fact is that we've all we're all doing it, and all of the ideologies that are peddled are are become um, huge beasts. That you're right, nobody can actually speak across or into or critique, because yeah. if you if you even hint at nuance, you're a bit you're a, you you've betrayed the 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 thing. You know, whatever the god has been that's been made. I think I think that's an interesting point. I, you know, years ago I was involved in uh, the Better Together when they had the whole indie rest. Yeah. And I remember, you know, myself, I'm not a tribalist person. Partisan politics does not do it for me. You know, I like the idea of liberals and power to the people, and that's what that means. And you know, giving more local power, localization. I'm, you know, more for that. I remember sat on a better ever on a, a, a debate panel, and you know, you had one person from one side saying, you know, we'll be the wealthiest country in the world, because oil prices will be cool. And the other person would go, oh, it's gonna be like through the floor and it's gonna be terrible. I was going, you know, I'm sat there in the middle going, hang on a second. The reality is it will balance between the middle. 
mm. fluctuation. And what you're peddling is the highest. What you're peddling is the lowest. Now, as hindsight has it, he wasn't quite as low as he probably should have been. But nobody knew that at the time. But I was saying, you know, this is, this is ridiculous. You guys are peddling. The reality is it'd be in the middle. This shouldn't be the argument that you're making it. And, you know, that kind of nuanced argument saw me kicked off. That was it. Never again would I be invited to go and speak at these panels. Because yeah, because it's too... It's it's too binary line. Yeah, it's not binary enough, you know. And if you're not binary in in your politic, in your ideology, in your theology, in, yeah. in whatever it is, um, somehow that's unsatisfactory for the methods of communication that we currently most rely on. Yeah. Thankfully, equally, there is a counter movement against this, which is to say that these are not soundbite issues. These are deep and complex issues and sadly nuances everything. And um, we are content to have long form conversation about this. Twitter don't do it. Reaction badges on my lapels aren't gonna do it. Tweets ain't doing it. Instagram can't do it. It needs to be a new recognition of nuance, recognition of um, difference and holding these things in tension to come to something that might look like a workable solution. The, the middle has to become much more robust and um, and I think much more prepared to, to hold its ground and not just wither in the face of the, well, you, you're a traitor because you don't think this or you're a, you know, it's a nightmare right now. And, and, and I think this whole kind of media thing does, does affect grassroots politics. You know, we are yeah. way past the day of like Michael Foot, you know, with his little are standing in the street bumping his fist or David Penn Halligan in Cornwall you know posting his leaflet through the letterbox you know it's now actually there's there's a lot of folk who just sit back because they don't really need to do very much campaigning because the party ticket will ride it through they don't need to do the whole kind of grassroots because we now have this sort of quasi-presidential system where it all happens from the top and you, you see it right across the UK you know politicians aren't what they used to be in terms of where they are in the community and how they engage in the community. And you sometimes see, now I see this particularly with housing and homelessness, that I really have a step two with another politician because, you know, he put on his leaflet, you know, anti-social behaviour in the town centre. Yeah. And he featured a project that you all know, Lindsay House, in his yeah. yeah. The picture of it on the back. Why people? <laughs> and, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I was like, this is inciting an issue and a stereotype and a prejudice. And he was like, but, but, you know, it's true. And I was like, but no, that's, that's not the point. How do you progress or move forwards when you've just gone and told four and a half Stigmatize thousand people? Stigmatised that whole building, yeah. <laughs> you told four and a half thousand people. There's, social, there's anti-social people, I never blamed the building. So you put a picture. The big picture of the three of you standing in front of the two of you standing in front of this building. And you know, and I think I think that's it. It's this kind of polarizing, pushy pashy. And I think, you know, it needs to, I, I don't offer any solutions. Um burn social media, uh tackle the servers. Um it's probably as close as I'm going to get to a real solution. <laughs> but also I think, you know move away from tribalism in terms of politics and more people turning around and going hang on a second you work for me and my vote is not based on anything other than what you do for me and i think that needs to be uh the change and you know i think the the issues that you've got that you cited at the weekend you know in part is because we've lost that we've lost that sense of you know, that people can just bash party to party rather than yeah. saying, hang on a second, my taxes pay for you to help make our community better. Uh-huh. Please list down all the things that you've done and don't give me the, 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 the rubbish that, what, what, what are you doing? Uh-huh. Because, you know, you've got a platform, you've got power, you've got opportunity, the likes of which many of us could never believe. Sure. But you're a Cornish unionist in Scotland. <laughs> um, well, how do you see Scottish 
politics then there's this in this new role you 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 will be finding and i and i think probably well it's coinciding with me starting this program but you're, you're now doing this and um i know that homeless in this network scotland um you think you're the bee's knees and you, you're just your position though you're not elected like you've said gives you access you'll be finding that people are inviting you to speak or or offer a sentence or something on different things but where do you see the context um an english guy in scotland who's been through homelessness he's raising his family in scotland who's moved into scottish politics in a, what is in scotland i think probably a pretty fringe party right am i is that fair to say yeah um how, how do you see the landscape of scottish politics then because in terms of making any kind of penetration into the into the big game yeah I, I think the challenge is that it's all come down to one issue. And I, I think, you know, if the, the challenge is that an awful lot of people think, you know, that that issue is the one that solves or doesn't solve everything that's happening. You know, if we achieve this... You mean independence? Everything. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That if, if we achieve this, everything will be fixed. And if we don't achieve it, everything will be broken. And on the other side, People think exactly the same and opposite. And what they're not seeing, and this is this is a challenge for the I see coming in, is that the, there's a whole lot of stuff we can fix today. You know, the city mission and today, you know, the every home collective are fixing stuff today, right now. And I think that that needs to be where I would like to see folk moving to right now is okay, I get this is a hugely important issue on both sides. There's an awful lot we can fix today. There's still kids that haven't got, that are growing up in houses that aren't sufficient, that still need fixed. There's yeah. still not enough houses being built. There's still, you know, whole estates being built without any kind of structure of community or, you know, any facilities or, you know, there's some of our schools are becoming the biggest schools in, in the UK. Right? They're becoming huge. And we're just, you know, we're not building new schools. For me, I think, I think the big challenge over the next five years and into the Scottish Parliament is talking to people about the things that we can fix right now. Right. What we can do, because, you know, these things won't happen, whatever side of the independence debate you're on, these things aren't going to happen overnight. Nothing is going to happen within, you know, we've seen what Brexit's doing, you know? Yeah. It is, this is a 10-year project. And, and whatever you have happen on the other uh, in scotland you know it would still be a 10-year project there's nobody you know I, I think they said somebody said 18 months and it will be done you know they are absolutely incorrect yeah yeah that's just not very you clever you need to be a political scientist no, <laughs> no. But 18 months is not going to happen right it's a lot of unpicking it's probably going to be 10 years it may be longer and i think that's the reality but what that does is that creates an opportunity right now to try and fix things. And so what I've been doing a lot of is listening to people in the housing sector, uh, organisations that are dealing with homelessness to understand a bit more what can be done, what can be fixed. Where appropriate, proposing some of my own ideas, chipping in with sort of thoughts, trying to work out how we might best fund it. What could, be, what could politicians be doing to support this more? I'm bringing that, and you know, it's it's great within a small team. You know, I deal, I work a lot with a guy called Alex Moore Hamilton, who's MSP and the health spokesperson. So feed a lot of those ideas, help to brief him and support him in terms of what's being done, what needs to be challenged. And I think you know, we're not here. I'm not here to go bash anyone around the head. You know, you're not going to be seeing any tweets or Facebook comments of me going, you know. You're a disgrace. You should have fixed homelessness. Like you, you've been in since 2007. What's keeping you so long? You know, yeah, yeah. it's about the solutions. It's about how you solve these things and move these things forward and promote these things. You know, and I think the Dems have been really good at this for a number of years because we've never been, you know, in the past. We've always been in the negotiators. So councils right across Scotland, we've normally like the junior partner. So we've always been excellent negotiators. You know, in the Scottish Parliament, again, you know, where our votes are so valuable for a minority administration, you know, we've been the negotiators. And I think that's what we need to keep and continue to promote is that within the Scottish Parliament sector, you know, 
the system was literally designed for negotiation mm. and for collaboration. That's that's how they designed the committee structures. That's how they designed the parliament. The voting system was supposed to support this so that everything that came out would be collaborative. Yeah. And some of the best policies uh, in Scotland, you know, have been collaborative policies. So, so, you know, in my role as housing spokesperson, it's great to have, I mean, can you imagine, Charlie, as a 17 year old in your coffee shop, <laughs> one day the two of us would be having a conversation. No. That would be high level about how we might be able to address these issues. We had many conversations about exactly this. Yeah, we would have done. These are the same conversations. Um, they're just that are the seats, the respective seats we are sitting in have, have changed. Um, but as anybody in, uh, who's any good at bartending will tell you that they 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 are, are well accustomed to having these conversations. They just never get the airing. Okay. But uh, so, so you don't see there being a, an issue. I mean. So I, I suppose what I'm poking at is what I would, uh, I'm interested in minority, can I call it minority politics? I'm interested in the health of um, Scottish politics in as much as the SNP really kicked Scottish Labour into touch. That's going to have a massive impact on the capacity for Labour UK to form any kind of government, right? Because it was reliant on the red brigade up in Scotland, right? Huge numbers of seats now completely given over to the SNP. As long as the SNP won't do a deal with Labour when it comes to a general election in terms of power sharing because of their one big thing, independence, and they can't back from that now, can they really? No, no obviously not. Right, no. so so they can't have a power sharing agreement at Westminster with Labour because part of the deal, if there was one, would be that, okay, we'll do this if you give us that. And, and no, so frankly, what we've got now is permanent SNP in Scotland, permanent Tory in uh, England, and that's a problem in yeah. terms of the 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 well-being and health and vitality um, and the transparency of a nation that has up till now always, um, I think, shown the world at least what the middle way can look like. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the coalition was our big opportunity to do that. Yeah. And I don't think you realise quite in this modern media, you know, the pariah nature of actually, and you know, and I'm, I'm biased, one of the most successful governments in terms of delivering their manifesto ever. I think we delivered somewhere in the manifesto more than any party since World War II. There was obviously a key pledge that we didn't deliver. Yeah. And that was it. The whole thing, the whole house of cards, you know, the pupil premium, you know, the health benefit, all that relationship. And I think that's probably that probably sent a significant kick down to this. I mean, I do wonder, you know, when we had that A B vote on proportional representation, how different politics could be today. How that has passed. Yeah. Because we still have governments elected on 30, 40% of the vote. Yeah. You sound, like, majority... you sound like Trump. <laughs> we, we, we won by a lot. That's what you're saying to me, isn't it? Uh, but no, I'm, I'm, no, I mean, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm not saying. No. That's exactly, exactly what I'm not saying. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, in, in this media, you know, it becomes very binary on particular issues, singular issues, issues mm. of papers, issues, and you know, the media control comes into that as well. But you know, I do again making making that point wonder, you know, if we had that proportional representation, yeah, what might have happened? Because you probably wouldn't have had David Cameron's majority that he had that delivered as the Brexit referendum. You probably wouldn't have the S and P landslides that we saw in Scotland, it would have been a significant gain. Yeah. And they would have had a significantly increased role in Scottish politics. 
but it may not have been a landslide. What's the German um, system? Do the German because the Germans have obviously Merkel's been in forever, but yeah. I think that's a, that. But that is as well. That's a that's a collaborative government, though, isn't it? And that's exactly it. And it's the same. In fact, we're quite far behind other European countries in this. Regard. Yeah, don't tell the British that they don't. They will. They will. <laughs> no, they'll, be, they'll be like, hang on a second. What? It's, yeah, this nationalist idea. No, <laughs> they'd be like, well, hang on. But you know, and it works really well in other countries. It I does. mean, I'm a big fan of the C series uh, Borg. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever watched Borg. No, I'll write it down. There, it's a new thing to watch, right? Borgen. So just what I was saying, so Borgen, I think, is is reflective of, I guess, the kind of government that I'd like to see. And this is a, I think you can get it on Netflix now. Uh, so it's a Danish TV program about politics. But it's essentially about a progressive politician who's part of a minority party who ends up finding himself becoming the prime minister of Denmark. <laughs> right. And is having to sort of constantly got wolves at the door, uh, has, you know, the extremist group more than happy to lend their support um, yeah. you know, and you know it shows a real interesting dynamic i mean there's obviously sort of your normal tv drama associated to it but it does show it's a really interesting dynamic of what it's like to have to collaborate and to work with these you know people who are friends yeah but they they're the politicians <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're friends because there's something in is something in it for them that's exactly it yeah. And I think, you know, the type of politics I'd like to see more in Scotland is more of this collaboration and more of this working together to promote mm. ideas. You know, I never got to be part of the parliament that had, you know, um, Winnie and, you know, Tommy Sheridan and, Rose and, you know, these all these different groups. You know, I think John Swinburne from, I think, the Pensioners Party, you know, you actually had smaller interest parties get elected. Yeah. And, you know, that for me is actually touching on what I'd like to see. Are there any other parties that you think are natu quite naturally align um, with you on that in, in, the, in the landscape that you see or, or operate or talk to? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, there's definitely across Scottish politics, and I think more so years ago there used to be an awful lot of collaborative thinking and a lot of sharing of the desk in fact you can probably see it most in the canteen at the scottish parliament because when you go in it used to be that everyone would mingle and often it would be done on a regional basis or an issues basis that there were some absolutely fabulous people jenny mara from the labor party would work very well with hamilton politician who's completely from the SNP on issues as human trafficking. Yeah. And that whole human trafficking bill was a collaborative effort. It was parties getting together, banging heads to make it happen. And I think that was a real high point of politics. And then I think the real low point is when they were doing the uh, opt-in organ transplants. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're trying to pass this bill so that, you know, you, you need to opt out, you're assumed yeah. in. And, yeah. you know, it's hey, thousands of lives every year right so there's there's no two roads about it and essentially the political parties had to defeat it uh because they didn't like who the spokesperson for the issue was is that true do you see that is that a fact no, it happened. sorry that actually yeah. happened that was, that was, and it's just based around sense. personality not around principle and, 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 and that was essentially it is that there was a huge squabble about who's promoting this and who's pushing this and you know i think that was a real low point and i think people that were involved in it saw it as a real low point because there was a great tremendous brilliant people who were involved in helping to make make that happen mm. and you know and it was uh, yeah and mctaggart who's a glasgow councillor who was telling me that you know this is essentially why the bill got voted down was because they didn't like that somebody else was, was pushing it forward mm -hmm. it's now packed I mean, it happened, you know, and it came back through. But I think that's a real low point for what we're... we're yeah, I like the idea, of, of, like what you described there as, um, a, as, a, as a collaboration across all... People, people effectively with different political um, perspectives, but with the same aims in mind, with the common yeah. betterment of the nation in mind. 
And so um, they can work together in the canteens. In fact, that's probably where the best power sits is probably in the canteen and in the water cooler moments. Oh, I suppose. And that's it. And they, they've now kind of broken up into different party groups. You kind of got like the conservative table, the SNP table. So I'm pointing to it, I'm imagining as I'm standing there where they all are. And then you've kind of got the other groups sort of sitting on the sidewalk. What's um, what's caused the change then? What's happened? Is it the dominance of the SNP? No, I, I, I think it's just the, the, the issue itself. And right. the referendum and indie referendum has, has, has made a lot of these issues quite binary. Yeah. And, and quite quite singularly strong. Um, you know, and that's that's without taking an opinion on the issue itself. Yeah. And I'll be very careful not to, you know, through this conversation, and in general, I'm very careful not to stamp an opinion on it because it's hugely important. And in the conversations that I have with people, it can be obstructive to get into that conversation. But actually, I, as a collaborator, should focus on the other issues because yeah. I know that once we get to that issue, that might be the wheels off the bus. Yeah. If we need to focus on what brings us together, and that's the thing is that's my wish for politics in the next five years, next ten years, is that we all tend to remember that there's a lot more that we have in common mm -hmm. than we disagree with, and yeah. that actually we probably, in terms of education, we probably agree. Yeah. In terms of homelessness, we probably agree. In terms so. of welfare. We probably agree, yeah. you know, on a lot of issues that need to be fixed. We're probably a lot closer to agreement. We yeah. need to kind of separate the other issues because I think, you know, it hampers progress. Um, I, th I think you see that right across, uh, right across it. But um, yeah, this, this reminds me again, Charles, of chat people have had in the bar of Frenchies. Uh, obviously. Now go on. Yeah, obviously quite different. I was just reflecting there in the, in the break uh, that we had in this recording that will be seamlessly cut out. And oh, yeah, together. seamless. <laughs> that, you know, it, it's amazing how these sort of relationships and people in your life, and, you know, and I, I thank God for this, yeah. you know, that our relationship has been like a constantly interweaving. Yeah. At times when, you know, one's needed help or the other's needed help, mm -hmm. they're a peer person. <laughs> at a point, you know, you, you reach a certain part in your life, you look over and there's Charles standing over there, yeah. slightly different. Uh, and, you know, and, I, and I, I thank God for that because, you know, that has been from it starting, you know, in the coffee shop to then how, and I was always very grateful to yourself and Adele and your whole family in terms of the support and helping me get to, 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 to where, where, where I've managed to to go because that was really important in terms of validation. But I think that reflects back onto what we need to do. And that is, you know, whether it's in politics, whether it's in housing, whether it's whatever it is, is, you know, telling people, this is yours. Yeah. You own it. Do. Yeah, you absolutely. Own it. <laughs> you know, I, I would love passionately in 10, 15 years to look at the Scottish Parliament and go, you're all starting to look like me. <laughs> you're starting to sound like me. Rather than me looking here going, right, somebody might find us out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they might realise that actually, you know, I am probably one of the only politicians without a degree. Yeah. In, in the building. You're too clever uh, for a degree, Paul. <laughs> but degrees, the degrees, uh, degrees are the entrance ticket for the ordinary person, whereas the exceptional will always do fine. And, and you're, you're just fine without a degree, I think. That's it. Until they do the entry exam and they go, listen, here's the requirements to get in. Congratulations, you, you won the vote, but you, you failed on all these other boxes. <laughs> no. But, you know, that actually, you know, I do hope that with, with the way that, you know, people from different backgrounds are starting to be in this and we're starting to get more people with lived experience in key places. And I think, you know, that would be my hope is that, you know, Scottish politics in future is shaped more on collaborative thinking, people mm. bringing ideas, bringing their own experiences. Because, you know, if you had, you know, a 
portion of the parliament was people who've got experience of welfare, of living in poverty. I think you could really be radical. I think you could really change things and shake stuff up, you know? Yeah. Because I, I think we can make a difference. I mean, we can make a massive difference. Um, and yeah, and that all goes back down to the place opposite Paisley Sheriff Court. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Yeah. And what just I want a couple of things and I don't I, I don't yeah. I, it's a challenge this next question because I don't think you're going to be able to answer it quickly and it's outside of the sphere which you've been given by yeah. your party. But what what would be your view on that so for uh, just to let you know the streets right now uh, in Glasgow are flooded with street value which is being mixed with heroin which undermines the effectiveness say of naloxone as a as a treatment which we've been using for years and the police have just started to carry uh, thank goodness because it, it saves lives but um yeah what's is there a position that the Scottish party holds on legalization of of drugs and and, and criminalization of these sorts of things yeah. you know so I mean, we were one of the first to actually make it part of policy to decriminalise. Okay. Um, and, you know, part of that is because you've got the criminal, not criminal element. And I think that invokes a slightly different characteristic set, different personality set. But also, you know, I think more as you, and we've seen this in other places, and I mean, we're getting reports from London, you know, in terms of, more people going into rehab and support than ever before because you know the street drug scene has sort of collapsed but that's why you're talking about these substitutes coming in and different yeah. things coming in because of that and i think you know as you move towards decriminalization it creates an interesting kind of idea that you know if you can get this from your pharmacy from your doctor you know and you can kind of really throw the bottom out of the illegal drug scene really yeah. like empty the bottom and i think they've seen this to some extent in portugal in the studies that they did yeah you know it then means that you know if, if, you, if you're an aspiring drug user you've got to go to your doctor and go listen doc i've had a great idea i'm thinking about becoming a heroin addict like you know and that's that's probably oversimplifying it and it is oversimplifying it but I, I think that's the key is is to actually you know give people support yeah. not criminalize them yeah i think that that's a real key we do that far too much remove the need for petty crime and remove the need for petty crime remove yeah a lot regulate of the regulate the quality of the particular poison that's it remove the um illegality of the economy and the unscrupulousness and the villainy of the of the of the sort of people that perpetuate this free market unregulated as it is I'm trying to think of an argument for not bringing the system. And, and I think that's it. And I think, I think the, the, the big argument against it, the, the big counter argument is the argument sounds so absurd that it can possibly, you know. We're, we're back to that <laughs> again. We're back imagine, to that. Imagine back, you know, and this is it. This is it. You know, you need to be a bold leader to make a move like this. Yeah. You really do. And because, you know, at the end of the day, imagine back to sort of some of the early churches that we both attended, proposing an idea like this in a group of people like that, they go, you two are absolutely off your rockers. Yeah. You guys have lost all sense. The solution to tackling drugs cannot be to decriminalise drugs because it's counter-logical. But actually, what we need to be doing more is, is putting that argument out to more people. We need to actually be making the case because the moment I saw the evidence, like five years ago, and my credit to Ewan Hoyle, who probably won't be watching this, but if he does, uh, who's been a huge advocate, <laughs> who's been a huge advocate on this for me, and was the person who actually gave this to me. And he, within our party, he is probably number one person in terms of promoting this and being on this. And the current stuff happening in Glasgow, most of the information I have is because of him. Yeah. Uh, and he's really helped to push our party into this direction at a time when people were going, his idea is so radical, he should probably be expelled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? But actually, you know, the more that, that people looked at it and went, where's the evidence? And, you know, this is one of those things. It's, we do have an evidence base now. We've got other places where this has worked. We've got other yeah. places where this is successful. It's not quite in the position of us going, we should be the first to try it. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe we should be moving towards that. So I'm I'm chairing a thing next week at Hollywood, obviously on Zoom, but uh, as yeah. imperfect as that is, it doesn't matter. Um, or oh, am I chairing it? I actually don't know. I was going to be a keynote. Maybe I'm part of a panel. Who cares? Hollywood are doing this thing. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. I'm going to be on it. It's about, and the cent is, is centered on the issue of drug death Scotland, right? Because the, yeah. the, that piece of work came out last year and it was horrendous. Um, and it's, it's a piece of, uh, it's a getting together and a bit of a, a group thinking session on and a discussion on drug death Scotland. And um, I'm guessing that this topic will feature. And so I, I suppose um, I'm asking ahead of that and I'll be, I'll be interested to see what other people come up with, but I'm trying to formulate actually what my thoughts are, because you'll know this now it changes when you're in a public position, you actually have to think about what you really think. Yeah. You know, and it's different. It's different, isn't it? Well, that's, that's exactly it. You can't just click around with this notion and go, this is what I think. Doesn't it, you know, in, in, in our roles, because, you know, there's always somebody who's really smart who turns around and goes, but why do you think that? Have you not yeah. considered the study? And you're yeah. like, no. This is the other thing I need to think about is <laughs> our, our supporters, um, most of them, many of them, like, so the whole point of me doing a series of conversations called The Chat, um, of which this is part, is to help people that are interested in the mission understand different areas in which the mission works and is aligned. Yeah. Well, as I speak to you today, I'm speaking very much from my own heart about this. I have a sister who's died through an overdose. My mother was a lifelong addict, um, which impaired um, my ability to spend time growing up with her. Um, I've had my own issues, you've had your issues, and now I work with an organization that works with people that have got substance issues and underlying trauma and mental health issues. Um, and so I've come to this place where I'm starting to think, actually, do you know what? Simple, just cut, cut the bad guys out of the equation and let's bring it in-house. Let's regulate the supply, regulate the quality, and remove the need for petty criminality. Your house not going to get broken into. You're not going to nick out your auntie's purse anymore. Why? Because you don't need to. And we can work with you because when you engage with the chemist, you're also going to potentially be engaging with other services that will wrap around you and help you move your life from chaos into something that looks like newness of life. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And that would be a good thing in my view. Um, but it's a bit too radical for people. I'm trying, the more I think about the logic of it, I don't understand why it's radical anymore. And, and that's the thing. And that's for, for people who are watching this conversation now, who are looking at this going, I can't believe Charles Martin is the chief executive of Glasgow City Mission. Espousing that. And how in this view, right? Let me just say and make very, very clear. The evidence supports it. And yeah. if you need access to the evidence, speak to Charles. Speak to, <laughs> speak to people. Speak you know, to me. Look at, well, <laughs> speak, you know, the evidence supports it. Look it up. And, yeah, we'll know, find there's, it. There's lots of stuff on the internet that supports this. So, you know, you're right, Charles. It's no longer, it should no longer be a radical issue. Mm. But I'm pretty certain that you'll probably get an email if somebody is watching this, if anyone is watching this. How going, dare you, oh, Charlie that's a, Mars? That's a bit radical. That's a bit yeah. radical, man. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's a radical notion. It is a radical notion. Yeah. But, you know, it's like turning around and saying, you know, the the way to solve um, violence is to make them better, at, you know, martial arts. <laughs> or or de decriminalise the prostitute and criminalise the John. Yeah, well, that's, that's another yeah. big, big issue. And I, I think it's probably one that our party's not quite got a full grounding on. Right. Because you, there's certainly... You hope. You don't know what they're doing after dark, Paul. That's the point. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's the thing, is that there's obviously there's two large groups within our party. Our party's voted uh, several times on this and decriminalizing prostitution in the, in, in the way that it becomes, you know, they, they've had groups that have come and spoken to the party several times on, you know, on decriminalizing and, you know, how it should be something that people can choose to do and, and it, a valid, valid career path. And then there's definitely the other part of the group, and I, I probably sit somewhere towards that group, probably not days in the middle. I think there needs to be another solution. I think there needs to be a middle way in terms of how to solve this. Because, you know, people, when we were debating this, kept mentioning sort of the bel de jour versus what's actually happening on the street. 
But I think that's it, is that we need a solution that addresses what's actually happening on the streets because it okay. is exploitative. Yeah. And, you know, and I think sometimes it gets brought in that this, and then as two guys speaking about it, as a, a sort of a feminist issue that actually protecting the sex worker is, is important, yeah. you know, if that's what they choose to do. Um, but on the flip side of that, there are definitely people for whom they have no control over their own body because they are being exploited. Yes. And whilst I respect the right of anybody to do whatever they choose to do, and I do, I respect, I respect people's yeah. individual rights, I also must stand up and I must defend those for whom it is simply not a choice. Well, that's right. I mean, there are those that there are those that have been um, that have been coerced. I'll, I'll never forget. Right. So when we got my sister up to the um, homeless accommodation in Paisley yeah. and she was a vulnerable woman from out of town with two kids or with her, th three kids with her. Um, I can tell you for a fact that there were pushes quickly knew exactly where to go. They just turn up at this address. There's a new person in there. They, they rattle and they need gear, right? So straight away, there's a feeding frenzy for supply. And then the next thing is one of the suppliers is saying, if you turn tricks, we can come to a deal on your supply, right? Now, a person in addiction with borderline personality issues, this is happening every day. Yeah. It's happening um, regularly. <laughs> You may remember we we drove up there. We were in Ferguson Park. We went by where the flat was. Oh, I went in it. You know, but we we, we saw people going in and like yeah. immediately yeah. the two of us drove by. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was. I, and you told me this, and I was like, no way. This could yeah, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and this is the thing. It's a real. It's a real. It's a real occurrence. And you you get a person like that who's that vulnerable. And you imprison them in a debt that they can't repay, and their bodies literally are not their own. Um, yeah. You know, on pain of death of their children, which is why this, in this instance, say Sharon and her kids were coming up from Oxford uh, into just from one frying pan straight into another frying pan because, um, yeah, the systems are just so imperfect, it's outrageous. And, and um, that's it. And I always look at that issue and just think, you know, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, absolutely. You know, in the place where I was, you know, that's what stuff is going on all the time. Yes. And, you know, but for me, I managed to get a job working in a nightclub. So I left before anything happened and, you know, and I came back. Yeah. You know, and let's not mention the fact that I was like 16 working in a nightclub. You know, we'll skip that part. Yeah. But I'm thankful. So thankful. Well, yeah, you're a big because, unit for that's why. Because when I came back, you know, as long as done, you know. Sure. And kind of toast. That's it. Abs absolutely. And you know, so so you, so you're there and you see it, and you just think, you know, thank goodness. Yeah. You know, I thank God. I re really do. You know, say that in a, in a public way. But actually, you know, that wasn't. In fact, my path went slightly different. But it does mean that I have particular interest in what's going on here. You know, Charles, we've seen it. You know, we were. Yeah, you know, your 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 um, journey though, Paul, because of your um, the, because of your affability and your charm and your intelligence and your genuine kind heartedness, you've navigated what would otherwise be it's a bit like a sci-fi. Let's go sci-fi for a second, right? You're like the Millennium Falcon hits an asteroid belt, right, but somehow manages to pull straight through without getting smashed, and and probably unawares of all the asteroids that it could have collided with. That's <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how you pull through that how does that work that analogy I, I, I think that's absolutely true because i do sit back and i sometimes don't quite realize I'll, I'll be honest i don't realize sometimes where i've come from like i i think the most sort of humorous and innocuous version of that story i have is when i was talking to my wife about how you know for our birthday present for, for birthday you know, we used to get to uh, pick a cereal. Yeah. And we used to get the toy that was in the cereal. And, yeah. and that's what we got for our birthday. And, you know, and that was fine. That was great. That was a brilliant birthday gift. Because, you know, you got to pick the cereal. And I love sugar puffs to this day because of that. It was always my choice, sugar puffs. But then my wife comes around and goes, but, oh, is that all you got? And I was like, of course it's all we got. <laughs> like, what else did we get? Yeah. There wasn't anything else to be had. What else would you um, want? 
<laughs> and that's it, you know. That's, that's brilliant. I got to pick the toys. It was amazing. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's only then when you sort of reflect and you see the horror in people's faces and something very simple like that, I forget, yeah. hang on a second, that you realise, hang on, we've gone from, we've got a very different, I think the word is brain of reference. And I think, I think that's one of the really important things that I never really was aware of before. How important frame of reference is. Yeah. Because it does shape so much. And I think this is one of the reasons why I now see inequality in certain things. Because it shouldn't be that we look and go, you know, a person's ability to do a particular role should be shaped by gender, shaped by race, shaped by their background. But I now see that to be the case because it's a frame of reference. And I think that's so important that you actually do have multiple engaged people with certain frame of references in order to be able to address certain issues. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's so important and, that, you know, the city mission is so uh, blessed and such a bold, such an excellent move to install yourself as the <laughs> chief executive. And you won't like me saying this. I don't like you saying you've that. Been, no. You've been lamping this all the other way. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I've been sitting here with a sense of awkwardness as you say this, ah. <laughs> but because, you know, I think it's so important and I think it is really important to engaging and moving conversation forward mm. to actually bring a reference. And that's probably the thing in the last two years I've learned the most is the importance of engaging with people, with key stakeholders that are outside of the, the, the big bubble but people who actually have, have something and bringing them with you, you know, yeah. looking at people, the users of the city mission. I know you guys do a tremendous job at engaging them all with the work that you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, and I know that the Every Home Collective has done a tremendous job at engaging, you know, users, people who are service users, people who are yeah, yeah. there. In terms lived of experience what, in, groups. and Lived experience. Yeah, and yeah. I think that moving forward, that has got to be, so important because if we're going to address some of the big issues if we're going to address things like poverty the fact that you know there are still kids today without a stable house mm. and I, I think number one that's probably the most important issue that the Scottish government needs to fix so I think if you can give a child a stable house where they're not worrying where you know food's going to come from you can start fixing things like health you can start fixing things like education you can start addressing things like crime yeah. and I think it's very important but other issues like, you know, prostitution, drug use, I think the more you engage with people, the more you bring people forward. And we're probably going back 40 minutes, you know, ah, the mistake of that right. tweet. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. engage, 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 engage. Yeah. Listen. Stop talking and listen. Well, you retain relevance, though, don't you, then? You can speak into a thing that you actually know something about. That you And, and what it but also requires a massive amount of empathy. It, it helps that you've got lived experience. You don't need the lived experience. It's helpful for you. But if you're not empathic, if you don't really understand people, if you don't get their predicament, then it's difficult for you to really be um, properly um, active in, in, in remedying the, the situation, I would suggest, because you're looking at it too much from a business perspective and or, or a spreadsheet perspective and not from a lived experience perspective. Um, I'm going to wind this up because yeah. I've uh, got, a, we, we could see Paul, we could do more of this. Do you see that? Like a six series. Yeah. Well, no, it'll go out, it'll, it'll go out as it is, uh, at least unless somebody else wants it and we'll have to trim it a bit, but that won't be, that would be all right. But in terms of, um, you cut the bits out that I'm in, um, in terms of other politicians or people in political parties um, that may be sympathetic to the Glasgow City Mission um, work. Um, and I don't just mean in that pat way, um, of course they, they do great work, blah, blah, blah. I mean, like they get it, they understand yeah. it, they may have experienced a little bit. I'm interested to have one of these conversations with them. I'm thinking of um, probably, because I'm not very political really, I have views. I have yeah. views, um, but I'm not party political. Um, so I'm quite keen to speak to a Tory, a Labour guy, a girl, um, SNP, um, uh, SDP. Um, so mm -hmm. SDP. 
Social Democratic no, no, Party. Used to be. Yeah, that's what we used to be. No, you started that, but you became something they else. Exist. They still exist, my friend. Let me just show you this because I've been doing homework. Oh my goodness, that's like exactly the same type font and everything. And you know, David Owen. No, it's uh, William Clouston is the guy who's doing right. it. You check him out on this on social media. And guess what their office is? 272 Bath Street, Glasgow. Really? No way, oh. right. And um, this is their little manifesto declaration of stuff on independence, democracy, society, tolerance, cultural renewal, the family, uh, social market economy, stuff like that, nation and the world. So it's quite a neat little document. That. So I recommend you have a look at that for a bit of your homework. <laughs> now I know that they exist. It shows how politically in tune you are. Charles, well, you say, oh, I'm not really, but I'm not very you political, but I am um, like a massive antenna, and I just <laughs> I, I'm I've got sensors out for a lot of different topics. And, that's, and, and I think that's and I think that's good. And I think you know having a balance between people who are elected politicians and those who are activists or in key roles, I think it's also quite good. So I can obviously speak for my freedom, but I'm not an elected person. Mm. I mean, I have a role, and I obviously represent the party, and you know, and if I said something completely obscene, somebody would probably take a wee cut and flip it. But you know, I can also speak from from the outside and from someone who observes and sees a lot of what's what's happening, and we can still, just to a certain extent, call it out without being necessarily, you know, you're breaking our traditions. <laughs> all right? Yeah, that was one of the things. When, when all those SNP MPs went down to Westminster, I think yeah. that was the thing that really blew their mind. I was like, you do what? You like rub what? Like rub Salt? the shoe or something? In wounds? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I, think, I think that's it. You know, you don't have to necessarily feel, feel, feel that. You can kind of still speak from that radical perspective. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is right. Mm -hmm. This is it. I, what the role you've got now and the role that I have now uh, without it sounding grandiose, because but in the true sense of the actual um, meaning of the word, your role is a prophetic role, which is to speak truth to power as you see it, interpret and speak the truth to the power. So there's a there's always this tension in the Old Testament between um, the priestly class and the prophetic. More often than not, the prophets get killed because the the priests are about setting up religious structures. And the yeah. prophets are about saying your structures have become broken. And um, there is always a tension, but they're always both necessary. And you can't, it's difficult to be both priestly and prophetic. Um, yeah. Other than that, the symbols and the instruments that the priestly use have a prophetic function. They point to something. But the actual job of calling, true, being in truth to power, that's a prophetic function, and that's what you, I think, are describing in terms of the opposition right now, and that's nice. And certainly, you know, what I'm studying at the moment a lot, uh, personally, is, is Daniel. You know, I've always had a real soft spot for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm. And I remember, you know, now that we've got our third boy, I'm like, in a missed opportunity, I told you, you should have gone Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. You know, just, just, just lived it through. Uh, and my wife is like, absolutely not. Those three names are not happening. Uh, and my kids know my, my certain love for Shadrach <laughs> and Daniel, you know, living in those places. Uh, but they didn't get killed. They fought on. Yeah, yeah, they did. Um, but they they were politicians. They were all for, you know, people in that space speaking that certain truth. And, you know, not too afraid of the con consequences. And I think that's... Non-conformists. That's it. And that's probably been the part that I think is sometimes the hardest to not think about the consequences. Yeah. <laughs> and to not think, you know, every time you say something, every time you write something, what happens if and, and you know, and this is where I have some sympathy for the Labour tweet. Yeah, agreed. But I don't want that to be the precursor for I don't want to get engaged with this issue ever again because it bit me the last time. Oh, it is me. I mean, I started exploring Twitter in March. Well, through uh, yeah. the first, yeah, and I was in. It was, it was interesting, but it's also time consuming, yeah. and I like nuance, and it's not the place for nuance. And I found myself 
okay, there were benefits because I caught the ear of people that I needed to at a particular time. But it was also utterly exhausting. And I was subject to these forces which were which were utterly polarized forces and um actually and what i found was i thought well if i put twitter down let's say twitter right put twitter down is my day-to-day -day work and the work of the glasgow city mission materially impacted and the answer is no twitter can twit twitter is an anomaly like it's a distortion it's a lens that distorts the whole of humanity and actually the work of glasgow city mission goes on irrespective of whether I'm on Twitter causing a storm or not. Um, and so, do you know what? I've decided, folk, I'm, I'm, for now anyway, I've parked it. Um, yeah. Because I think yeah, it does create disincentives to engagement, unless you're somebody that loves loves online fights. Yeah. I, I don't. It's, it's a big echo chamber. And I, at one point, this was probably back in 2011, 2012, you know, I had nearly 25,000 people following my Twitter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it was addictive. I was like, wow, these people are engaged with what I've got to say. And, you know, and I think it was then a bit later, maybe 2013, 2014, I was just like, this is toxic. Like, this is taking over what's yeah. going on. And I completely just withdrew. And so I'd send like four or five tweets a year. But recently, having taken on this new role, I yeah. started then re upping that and engaging because I found it useful to understand what's going on. I yeah, think it's think a necessary, it's necessary if you're doing what you're doing, I'd say. Yeah. And, and a lot of journalists follow it as well. Oh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> They're not really into what's going on. And so I started re-engaging with it, but it, it's not shaping my view of the world. It's not changing the way that I necessarily think. And no. I am trying very, very hard not to respond to the people who are baiting. Yeah, good. <laughs> so I'm getting involved in that because I'm singularly there to understand a little bit more about what organisations like yourself is doing, what Colin's doing. I've definitely been engaged otherwise, and I've not been on Twitter, so that's really useful. Um, and what other organisations are doing, you know, you do get a very unique perspective yeah. in terms of what's what's happening. I think that's that's very useful to me. Mm. Um, but yeah, I. I think, I think that probably pulls us around. <laughs> I think it does. We've got, we've got a knock on the head, Paul. Well, thanks, Paul. <laughs> yeah. This is a great thing to see your face and um, <laughs> just see your, see your cheery smile. And um, I'm praying for every success in, in everything that you're doing. Thank you very much. Do you have to hold down the day job as well as do this stuff? With yeah, the... so my, my full-time role is... Uh, still with uh, a training company doing business development so I do that my nine to five sometimes eight to half past ten uh -huh. gosh and then balance balance that alongside you know the the other roles as you know vice chair of the party and lead their conference so how, how does that work with the family you know yeah I mean um working from home has helped an awful lot yeah that, that's been huge. The lack of travel has helped a lot. Uh, I used to use my travel time a lot to do my other sort of interests. Okay. The art and stuff. Whereas now, actually, it just creates more time. You know, cool. more time to be able to balance that. I've got three incredible boys. Yeah. Uh, an even more incredible wife. Um, she must be. You know, <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Not political in the slightest. No. And, and yeah. where do you stay? Still in East Kilbride or So yeah, so we live we live here in East Kilbride. Um and have done for yeah, a number of years. Um yeah. and this is largely, you know, I'll be a candidate next year at the Scottish Parliament for East Kilbride and Good. also for the central Scotland. So that's like from East Kilbride to Falkirk. Yeah. Which is which is interesting because, you know, without opening a whole brand new conversation, it takes us ten minutes to unpack. Which we're not gonna know, do. Which we're not going to do, <laughs> you know. You know yourself. East Kilbride from one end to the other is radically different. It is very different. And you multiply that from you know people in the south who are just like, please stop ignoring us, and please yeah. give us infrastructure, please give us resources. The people in the north who are like, please stop trying to take away our resources. <laughs> you know, huge fear over Grange Park. Yeah. And what happens there? Yeah. And then you know, a political agenda that kind of hovers a great cloud over bigger than the one it creates itself. 
Yeah. Uh, and all of the know? former industrial bits. Yeah. You've got a lot, there's a lot between what, Fulcourt, <laughs> Larbert, Denny, um, all the Camber, Cambernold. Yeah. The yeah whole, massive, the whole massive. And, and they need politicians. They mm -hmm. desperately, desperately need people who can sit and listen and, and, and take on what, what they're doing, probably more than sort of the two big cities or yeah. the three big cities, if you like, triangulate that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so that's my next sort of six months is really engaging with this housing grief that I've got. Well, you got your work cut out, Paul. Supporting that and then uh, looking on to what happens uh, in six months' time. Yeah, what, well, the, the Scottish elections? Oh, yeah. Scottish elections, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like the meme, there's still a chance. <laughs> there's still a chance. There is always a chance, Paul. Right, God bless. I'm going to stop recording right now. Okay.